Hey guys, thanks so much for joining us again on another episode of Book Insights. I'm Tom Butler Bowden. You know the drill by now. What we do is deep dives into non-fiction bestsellers, covering 20 to 30 minutes. Some of the books we cover are recent hits, others are ancient classics. The main thing is that every book can improve your life or your work, or just make you think. As a human, I've always been totally fascinated by what constitutes human nature. Depending on who you talk to, we're basically all good or all bad. I think of those studies of identical twins separated at birth who grow up in very different environments but end up showing similar personality traits. From these, it's safe to assume that genes control our behavior. But in his book, Behave, top biology professor Robert Sapolsky shows how nearly all our behaviors involve a complex interaction between biology, environment, memory, culture, and genetics. In the past, the abuse of genetic science has led to some pretty dark things like eugenics, forced sterilizations, and genocide. Genetic determinism is totally discredited now, thank God. And in its place, we've got a lot of research on the brain's incredible ability to change and rewire itself. I'm sure you know people who have changed in big ways despite tough upbringings or trauma. And the science tells us that harsh environments do in fact prime people's neural wiring for aggression and violence. But later environments can work the other way, wiring us for positive change. So I like Sapolsky's book because it provides a scientific rationale for what self-help writers have said for over a century. That change is not only possible, but some people show an incredible ability to overcome odds. So the bottom line, Our biology and genes are an important part of who we are, but they're more like a springboard and rarely determine what we may become. Hope you enjoy the book insight. If you do, please take a second to leave a comment or rate it. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on the platform you're listening to. If you like 24-7 access to our library of over 100 book insights, just go to memo.com forward slash insights you'll see the link posted on the podcast description. Okay, let's get into Behave, the biology of humans at our best and worst. Imagine the situation. There's a dead calm around you, yet a searing tension that you could cut with a knife. You've got to find a way to get out of this alive. You move one step at a time, slowly around each new corner. Silence is what you need the most, but each footstep sounds like foghorns going off. Your eyes move frantically to scan each new detail of your surrounds. Sweat drips from your forehead. Suddenly, a noise startles you. What was that? You whirl around and pull the trigger. You did it. You fired. You behaved and in such a manner that the consequences could be dire. In a moment, you will find out if you hit your target and if the target was what you thought it was. Now, what made you do it? Did you choose to pull the trigger, or was it more of an instant reaction? Were you the aggressor, or did you shoot out of fear? Are you a hero or a villain? How did you get into this situation anyway? Are you part of a group? Are you psychotic? In the New York Times bestseller, Behave, the Biology of Humans at Their Best and Worst, Stanford University biology professor Robert Sapolsky provides these kinds of scenarios and then proceeds to examine them from the perspective of many disciplines. The ground he covers is comprehensive, ranging from the neurobiology that caused the very motor action of pulling the trigger to the instant before the action was executed. Sapolsky even delves into the advancements and changes in culture and society over millennia that contributed to the morals, judgment, and decision-making of the person holding the gun. The key thing about human behavior, Sapolsky emphasizes, is its complexity. Every behavior involves a rich interaction between biological factors, environment, memory, culture, and genetics. Each influences each other on timescales that span from milliseconds to eons. Human action can be approached from contested findings, perspectives, and theories, each contributing unique insights. 
He navigates these rapids by way of many examples that anyone can relate to, gleaned from his own work and from hundreds of landmark studies. Sapolsky insightfully explores the nature of violence and of aggressive behavior throughout Behave. The book is about humans at their best and worst. We have a love-hate relationship with violence. We love it when it is good or socially useful and are appalled by it when it is not. The implications are crucial to structuring our current legal systems, the origins of mass killings and of war. What is the level of control we have over such behavior? And what is the level of responsibility we have for our actions? Here is Sapolsky being interviewed on The Daily Show. Well, I think the starting point is, you know, we're a miserably violent species, but at the same time, we're also an extraordinarily altruistic and compassionate one. This book, Insight, will look at the main themes from Behave through the following questions. What causes our behavior? What's the interaction between genes and environment? What are the cultural influences on behavior? What's the link between biology and free will? We're a violent species. Is peace ever possible? We'll end with a recap of Sapolsky's argument and its importance. Let's get back to pulling the trigger of a gun. Was someone shot? Was someone a killer? There couldn't be a more serious instance of behavior to explain, so let's begin with the immediate causes that could instigate the pulling of the trigger. This is going to involve some neuroscience concerning various brain areas, their role in causing action, and the neurotransmitters involved in their communication. Hang in there if it seems like a steep learning curve. The brain structure at the heart of our sense of self is the amygdala. It oversees fight or flight, the feelings of fear and anxiety, and the control of aggression. To illustrate its importance, Sapolsky discusses the case of Charles Whitman, a mass murderer who was shot dead at the age of 25 while on a killing spree that ended the lives of 17 people. Whitman was usually calm, controlled, and intelligent. However, in the days before the murders, he experienced strange and irrational thoughts and desires. He also suffered massive headaches and was abusing amphetamines. In a note left during his rampage, he requested that an autopsy be performed on his body. It revealed a pecan-sized tumor impinging on his amygdala. A direct link between the amygdala and aggression has been found in countless studies. But in fact, amygdalic activity is more related to fear and anxiety than aggression itself. For example, in a study involving shocks administered after random intervals, subjects chose to receive more painful shocks immediately rather than deal with the fear and anxiety of not knowing when a shock would come. Another key brain area involved in human action is the frontal cortex. This area is both functionally and anatomically unique to humans. What's more, it isn't completely mature until your mid-20s. Why? The frontal cortex is crucial for any complex decision-making. It helps you balance internal desires and accumulated social intelligence before you take action. The neural connections here involve many years of refinement on the way to adulthood. It is the part of the brain least influenced by genetics and the most by experience, learning, enculturation, and environment. But what would happen if someone lost their frontal cortex, say, in a freak accident? This is exactly what happened in the case of 19th century American railroad worker Phineas Gage. An explosion caused an iron rod to shoot through his skull. The rod annihilated his left prefrontal cortex with remarkable anatomical precision. Gage survived miraculously, but was a changed man. He lost social control. A medical evaluation at the time reads, the equilibrium, or balance, so to speak, between his intellectual faculties and animal propensities seems to have been destroyed. He is fitful, irreverent, indulging at times in the grossest profanity. Gage became an exhibit in P.T. Barnum's Circus of Traveling Curiosities. What is less often reported is that Gage, in time, regained much of his old responsible self. The side of his frontal cortex that had not been taken out was able to take on more of its functions. This tells us something about the malleability of the brain. In this part, we begin our discussion on Robert Sapolsky's Behave, the biology of humans at our best and worst. We look at the connections between aggression and our neurobiology. 
The amygdala controls our fight or flight or our aggression. The frontal cortex balances internal desires, social intelligence, and self-control. Next time, we'll further discuss the functions of our brains in regard to behavior. Then we'll go into the interaction between genes and environment. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. You've got plenty of people who know the difference between right and wrong, yet in a particular moment, a moment of particular arousal, particular stress, particular neurological impairment, nonetheless, they do what they know to be is the wrong thing. This is Stanford University professor Robert Sapolsky speaking with Trevor Noah on The Daily Show. In his 2017 book, Behave, The Biology of Humans at Our Best and Worst, Sapolsky explores anthropology and evolutionary psychology to understand how and why we behave the way we do. In this part, we'll continue our discussion of neurobiology and its relationship to aggression and control. Then we'll discuss genes and our environment. It's in the frontal cortex, Sapolsky says, where a person does the mental processing that results in doing the harder thing when you think and feel that it is the right thing to do. In a very real sense, it's what divides the animal in us from the human. Our ability to do the harder, more correct thing is controlled by how rewarding that thing is, when the reward will come, and how likely we think we'll be able to get it. The frontal cortex works in concert with a network of other brain regions called the limbic system, fueled by the neurotransmitter dopamine, the feel-good chemical. This network also involves hormones, for example, testosterone. Testosterone, the stereotypical culprit of male aggression, could easily be behind the pulling of the trigger. In reality, testosterone is more involved in maintaining or gaining social status. It only causes us to be more sensitive to triggers of aggression, say in stressful situations, rather than creating aggression outright. Extremely aggressive men, for example, who were castrated as part of their therapy, can still be aggressive if their behavior is more the result of extended bad social learning. Hello, frontal cortex. In most males, however, testosterone simply increases confidence and optimism. As for maintaining status, Sapolsky concludes that if you engineered the right social circumstances, boosting testosterone levels during a challenge would make people compete like crazy to do the most acts of random kindness. Sapolsky surmises that testosterone isn't nearly as much of a problem as is the frequency with which we, as a society, reward aggression. We're not the reactive animals we once were. Rather, when we perceive circumstances in which aggression is justified, violent action is seen as heroic and then is rewarded. Does it sound like these conditions can initiate warfare? Sapolsky talks about the strange contradictions in our attitudes to violence. When channeled the right way, like in sports, for example, it can help maintain culture. But it can equally lead to that culture's destruction in war. This is why it is fiendishly hard to identify exact causes of specific behaviors. One cause may lead to completely different outcomes. The combining of your parents' genes was a little miracle. A little miracle that would oversee the creation and assemblage of proteins that would ultimately make you you. But in what way are we merely the result of our biological and genetic inheritance, and to what extent are we self-made? In explaining the complexity of gene-environment interaction, Sapolsky begins with the fact that a flabbergasting 95% of your DNA doesn't even code for making the proteins that constitute your basic physical building blocks. Within this multitude of non-coding genes are ones that dictate when to turn other genes on and when to turn other genes off. These genes are often triggered by environmental factors. What does this mean in practice? For one, surrounding a child with a positive, nurturing environment is pivotal. Positive, supportive environments create the kind of experience that foster an optimal frontal cortex, one that can be used to do the right thing even if it is the harder thing. Yet Sapolsky does not underplay the role of genes either. 
He mentioned studies involving identical twins separated at birth, who grow up in drastically different environments, yet demonstrate remarkably similar personality traits. One of these involved twin brothers. One was raised in Trinidad and Israel as a practicing Jew, able to converse in Yiddish. The other was raised in Germany as a strident Nazi youth. Upon an apprehensive meeting of the two, a host of unlikely similarities were revealed, right down to the shared habit of flushing a toilet before using it. Another more recent study reveals the power of environmental influence. It involved a strain of genetically alike mice. They were to be tested in different labs for various behaviors relevant to addiction or anxiety. Extreme effort was undertaken to keep the mice under exactly the same environmental conditions. They were fed the same food on the same schedule, housed in the same brand of cage, and even on the same thickness of sawdust. Despite such effort and control, they showed massive differences that could only be attributed to environmental influences. As Sapolsky eloquently puts it, genes aren't about inevitability. Instead, they're about context-dependent tendencies, propensities, potentials, and vulnerabilities. This is important because throughout history, people have tried to use genetic inheritances to put people in boxes. Pseudoscientific genetics, he notes, have been used to justify racial, gender, and class discrimination. It's led to selective breeding, forced sterilizations. It's been an aid and a spur to those who lynch, ethnically cleanse, or march children into gas chambers. Fortunately, genetic determinism has been discredited. In its place, Research has demonstrated the brain's incredible ability to change and rewire itself. The brain's neuroplasticity has been the subject of countless books in the last decade, such as Norman Doidge's The Brain That Changes Itself. In one well-known piece of research, the regions of the brain relating to spatial knowledge actually grew among students training for the London Cab Driver License Test, an extreme test of spatial ability. Their brains literally are bigger after studying for the knowledge. Sapolsky asks us to consider that it was such plasticity that enables old dogs to learn new tricks. On a day-to-day -day level, we all know this is possible. History shows many people who were raised amid chaos and violence and yet had a series of awakenings that put them on a path to distinction. Even if a hard environment makes a person's neural wiring ripe for aggression and violence, an interaction of new environmental factors can interact with that wiring to cause changes that can benefit everyone. It's not all about biology and it's not all about environment, but about how these mutually influence each other under the right conditions. Our biology and genes are an important part of who we are, but they're more like a springboard and rarely determine what we may become. In this part, we examined the frontal cortex of the limbic system and how it relates to aggression. The frontal cortex, along with hormones, allows us to make positive decisions rather than destructive lizard brain choices. As a society, however, we must learn how to channel aggression into something constructive. We also discussed environmental factors as opposed to genetic ones in relation to determinism. Sapolsky suggests that while genetics can dictate a great deal of who you are, it is only a starting point from where the environment will shape and mold you. Next time, we'll conclude our discussion on Robert Sapolsky's Behave by going into biology and free will. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodeapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D app.com slash insights. When it comes to free will, we assume there's a homunculus, Latin for little man, in our heads. The little man contemplates and judges a host of possible actions for every situation we encounter, including those involving doing right or wrong. We assume that the homunculus controls both our morals and our actions in a manner separate from our own brain, in some kind of magical process outside of the rules of physics and science. If we live in a purely physical universe, this homunculus can't exist. This puts into question the whole idea of free will. In his 2017 book, Behave, the Biology of Humans at Our Best and Worst, Stanford University professor Robert Sapolsky investigates our choices and our behaviors through our biology, 
environments, and circumstances. In this part, we'll discuss the question of free will. Then we'll conclude with a brief review. For particular crimes, we allocate responsibility to biology rather than free will where it seems reasonable. For example, recall Phineas Gage who lost his frontal cortex in a freak accident. If Gage commits a crime or someone flails a knife while in the fit of a seizure, it sounds like the work of biology. Yet we are still invoking the homunculus in the rest of the cases, assuming people have total free will. In fact, our behavior is always the result of the state of our brains at any one moment. In Sapolsky's mind, where we draw the line for mitigating responsibility is pretty arbitrary. To stir up the murkiness between biology and free will even further, Sapolsky describes the famous 1980s study of Benjamin Libet, the Libet experiment. The findings of this study are as mind-boggling and unintuitive as those found in quantum physics. Participants were simply asked to make a movement and note the time on the clock to the very second that they decided to initiate their motion. Using electroencephalograms, EEG, Libet monitored their brain activity. He found a consistent spike in activity that he called the readiness potential. It indicated the initiation of a movement appropriately in the motor cortex. What was striking was that the readiness potential occurred about a half second before the reported times of conscious intent to initiate the movements. In other words, the participants' brains showed the intent to move before they were consciously aware of their own decision. But let's get back to the relevance of biology and neuroscience in legal matters. How much responsibility should we attribute to the brain and how much to the homunculus? the apparently rational, free-thinking person inside us. Could all criminal acts, including murder, rape, and theft, be the result of uncontrollable biological process? If so, everyone should literally be able to get away with murder. Obviously, this should not be so. On the other hand, if we do the opposite and hold people completely responsible for their behavior, we are back in the Middle Ages. Then, for instance, seizures were assumed to be caused by demonic possession. They were a sure sign that a woman was a witch. This understanding was originated by the church in the 1487 writings of friars Heinrich Kramer and Jacob Sprenger. It was an interpretation of the gospel according to Mark, books 9, verses 14 through 29. A man writhed and convulsed, foaming at the mouth, who was undoubtedly seized by the devil. Now, consider that the upper limit for worldwide prevalence of seizures, occurring at some point during a lifetime, is 10 in 1,000. This begs the question of how many women were burned alive at the stake for epileptic seizure. So, what's the answer? We can't punish people for how they are wired or their medical conditions, but neither can we let the general public off all responsibility. A reminder of Sapolsky's broad thesis. Human behavior is best examined as a range of factors at work and working on each other in a complex way. Here is Sapolsky during a TED Talk. Most importantly, brains change. Neurons grow new processes, circuits disconnect, everything in the brain changes, and out of this come extraordinary examples of human change. Any accurate explanation for why the man in the introduction pulled his trigger must come from every discipline that surrounds human behavior and biology. To bridge these links, a deep understanding of their interaction is required, beginning at the moment immediately before the trigger pull and spanning back to time before civilization, when the human brain was evolving into something similar to what we know today. The science of human behavior is extremely contentious, the root of such contention is not only a difference in the opinion of scientists, but of evidence. Equally strong evidence seems to support equally sound theories regarding the same phenomena. Sapolsky wades through this pricky territory not by favoriting and emphasizing one theory over another, but by carefully describing the merits and blunders of each theory in turn. In this way, he avoids controversy himself. But more importantly, he offers a way forward by objectively using science to increase understanding of human behavior in ways that reduce aggression and violence, while at the same time promoting and enabling our capacity towards mutual understanding and peace. 
In a final sentiment, he quotes philosopher George Santayana, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. In a similar way, it could be said that those who do not appreciate human behavior as multifaceted will be doomed to support answers that blame the wrong people for the wrong things. Let's remember that trying to understand ourselves is a species-wide project. The more we know about how our brains work, the greater chance we may have to channel our secret wishes for violence into healthy things and to celebrate and increase the behaviors that further peace, prosperity, and friendship. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice. Thank you.